Then, one day, a terrible thing happened. An angry rhinoceros appeared out of nowhere and gobbled up his poor mother and father. Their troubles, if they had any at all, were over in 35 seconds flat. Ridley is an incredible villain. Given my biases, that may seem like a questionable assessment. He is a giant, fire-breathing pterodactyl from outer space that serves as an enforcer for a group that self-identify as space pirates. For a series praised for its subtle storytelling, that's laughably on the nose. It isn't so much a character description as it is a list of words to excite a five-year-old. And yet, I stand by my statement, Ridley is an incredible villain. He is such an incredible villain that he has somehow managed to usurp the title of Samus's arch nemesis from seemingly more worthy candidates. Mother Brain, Dark Samus, even the Metroids, even the creatures that give the series its name. All of this in spite of the fact that he's never actually been the primary antagonist of any of the games he's appeared in. It's not a bad resume for Barney the Dinosaur's JK cousin. But as simple as the character is, he is frequently misrepresented. There exists a popular perception of Ridley as a devious schemer, a cunning god of death, if you will, that misunderstands why he became such a prominent and persistent presence. In fact, if you'll permit me to get a bit hyperbolic, this idea of Ridley misunderstands the appeal of Metroid as a whole. Because of course that's my problem, that's always my problem. Every second video on this channel is about how you lot are enjoying Metroid incorrectly. No even that sorry to be honest. Pirates threaten the open seas, and the same is possible in space. 1986's Metroid became the template for an entire subgenre of adventure titles, one driven by exploration and character growth. In a lot of games, the character's growth is abstracted by an array of incrementally increasing numbers. In Metroid, power-ups instead represent a tangible improvement in strength and versatility. Each one becomes a new tool for the player to use. Every new power-up is accompanied by the knowledge that new obstacles can be overcome, new areas can be accessed, new secrets can be discovered. Atmosphere is an important part of this formula. To get the player searching for secrets, the game needs to create the impression that these alien worlds have secrets to hide. Intricate environmental details clue the player into hidden areas, they guide the player around the map, they suggest a backstory for the planet and the people that lived there, they establish the behaviour of the native fauna and flora, and they leave the player dreading the unknown even as they're trying to uncover it. Combat is also tied to the player's progression. Samus begins each game relatively weak, but she transforms into a powerhouse so gradually that it's easy to overlook. By the end of the game, Samus is crashing through enemies without breaking stride. She feels almost literally unstoppable by the end of most of her adventures. Exploration. Atmosphere. Combat. Now, this isn't a, a deconstructive analysis, so I don't want to establish these as the three pillars of Metroid or anything like that, but I think that it's difficult to argue that they are not three core parts of the Metroid experience. Ridley is such a mainstay of this series because he complements all three of those principles. Okay, so I say that, but Ridley had what you might charitably call a modest debut. Standing only slightly taller than Samus, the cunning god of death's cunning strategy is to hop in place and shoot fireballs, freeze them with the ice beam, 
and he resorts to his ultimate stratagem to hop in place and not shoot fireballs. His first impressions go it isn't great, but even this early on, you can see the makings of the villain that Ridley would soon become. He is one of the game's few mandatory objectives, and so the instruction booklet draws a lot of attention his way, cementing him as an important character before the player has even turned on the console. It's easy to underestimate the value that that small addition can have. While it's possible to beat Metroid in only a couple of hours, it's likely to take a lot longer on a first playthrough. If it's taken you days or even weeks to reach Ridley, then that's a lot of time for anticipation to ferment. There's a payoff when you finally reach that fight, even if the fight itself is disappointing. And it's this paradigm of anticipation and payoff that 1994's Super Metroid executes a hundred times more effectively. I don't know why I picked up the coaster. I... I have the game. I, I have the game, I had it under there prepared for this shot, and I went for the coaster. Ridley makes his presence felt before the game has even been bought. He dominates the front cover, clearly establishing the dynamic between himself and the off-balance Samus. It's not a scenario that ever happens literally, but the message is clear. Ridley is too much for Samus to handle. And that power imbalance is made immediately obvious when the game begins. Ridley is the first enemy encountered, an imposing presence by his sheer size alone. He seems almost disinterested in the fight, lazily swatting at Samus with his tail and leaving once she's in critical condition. It feels like he's toying with her, Samus is beneath Ridley's notice. It takes Super Metroid a couple of minutes and a few walls of text to establish the story so far, but Ridley is such an effective motivator that it almost needn't have bothered. He's killed people. He's stolen something important. He's humiliated you. He's escaped. And there was nothing you could do about it. The rematch is inevitable, and the game makes sure that he isn't forgotten. He occupies a dominant spot atop the golden statue that blocks the final area, and while the other bosses hide themselves around the map, Ridley proudly announces himself. His effigy is a cruel tease, so close and yet so far, but it clearly indicates where Ridley can be found. From that moment on, you know where your objective is and what you need to reach it. The descent through Lower Norfair is a very pure expression of tension in terms of the medium. It's a series of dangers escalating towards a climax. It's difficult to resist the temptation to describe this area as the belly of the beast when you literally enter through Ridley's gaping maw, but instead I'll resort to another cliché. It feels like you're delivering yourself right into his clutches. The threat of Ridley hangs over this area even while pushing through the mini-bosses, the rising lava, the spike traps, and the swarms of space pirates. You know that he is close, but you don't know exactly when you're going to stumble across him. That is, until you reach the living door that has blocked access to every major boss. The snag of silence when entering Ridley's chamber is perfectly timed to take advantage of the player's expectations. For the first time, you know who you're going to be fighting before you even enter the room. Charging in and finding only darkness and silence is a moment designed to catch you off guard. It may not have the same effect on every player, but it is more likely to have some effect than if expectations were met and Ridley started attacking as soon as the door closed. Struggling players might experience a moment of dread, cooler heads might have a moment to catch their breath, impatient players might begin searching for a way out, and nervous players might get a fright when he appears. There is the possibility for the player to react to this moment of silence, and without wishing to overstate it, I think that possibility is valuable. Games are an interactive medium, and this is a moment where the player can use that interactivity to create their own little narrative. It allows the player to establish their own relationship with the scenario, which is more special than if Samus's reaction was defined by a cutscene. It's simple, but it's not diminished by that simplicity. 
And the same goes for Ridley. All of the other bosses in Super Metroid have a kind of rhythm to them. You wait for them to expose their weak point before launching a counterattack. Moments of respite are punctuated by exclamation points of action. But Ridley is all teeth and claws and spines, and he is relentless. There's no weakness to expose or strategy to puzzle out, it is a frantic fight to the death. Ridley is the penultimate boss, fought only once Samus is at the peak of her strength. This is an opportunity to use Samus's full arsenal, all of the items that you've gathered across the length of the game, on a monster that is worthy of that firepower. And even in death, Ridley gets the last laugh. The relief of defeating any of the other major bosses is augmented by the satisfaction of collecting a new power-up. But the relief of defeating Ridley is poisoned by the reminder that you have not won yet. Retribution hasn't accomplished your mission, the last Metroid is still in the hands of the space pirates. So it's easy to see how Ridley plundered the position of the game's most memorable villain from Mother Brain. He is a tour de force of design, complementing all of the game's most important principles. He drives exploration, providing a clear goal to work towards from the very beginning of the game. Both the player and Samus are given a clear reason to track down her nemesis, who lurks somewhere within the depths of Zebus. Finding Ridley is the main goal for most of the game, and it is obvious what is going to follow once that goal is reached. Ridley enhances the atmosphere by building tension as the player closes in on him. Spotting his sculpture means that the rematch is drawing nearer, which, depending on your perspective, may be either encouraging or threatening. And all of that anticipation pays off in one of the most frantic and fun fights in the game. He presents a combat scenario that is completely different from any other, one where you can toss caution aside and unload everything you have into this titanic monster. The exploration, the character-defined progression, the atmosphere, the combat, the level design and the associated mise-en-scene, the pacing, the music, the plot, all working in harmony to create Metroid's ultimate agent of discord. Super Metroid is lightning in a bottle in general, and I hope that I'm not courting too much controversy when I say that this is Ridley's finest hour, this is the best he ever gets. The rest of his appearances are slightly derivative of Super Metroid. He appears early in the game to tease a late game boss fight. But that isn't to say that he becomes worthless. The series had eight years to muse over Super Metroid's successes before the near-simultaneous release of Metroid Fusion and Metroid Prime in 2002. They each took the Metroid series in a different direction, one more linear and dramatic, and one more grounded and atmospheric. And it's a testament to both Ridley's impact and his surprising range that he becomes the only boss to return from Super Metroid in both games. In Fusion, he doesn't present a threat or a mystery. His frozen husk isn't hidden shamefully away in an obscure corner of the map, he can be found behind minimum security on the main deck. Finding him is of no consequence, and he isn't mentioned by dialogue even once. He would be almost unremarkable, were it not for the ex-parasites. Ridley's husk is just as much at the mercy of the ex-parasites as everything else on the station. Wandering into Sub-Zero containment and discovering his frozen corpse is accompanied by a chilling music piece, and I don't think that's because of Ridley himself, but rather the context in which you find Ridley. One of Samus's most deadly enemies is aboard a ship filled with malevolent, body-snatching parasites. Fusion is known for interrupting the player with text boxes, but it doesn't need a single word to convey the danger here. If anything, the scene where Ridley is taken is made more suspenseful by its predictability. It's easy to see what's going to happen, and the game emphasises that inevitability and how powerless Samus is to stop it by forcing the player to drop into his chamber themselves. You are forced to make the decision to trap yourself in a tiny box with Ridley and risk waking him up. So when everything goes exactly as you predicted, you feel responsible. That horror movie cliché of, why would you go in there, is a lot easier to empathise with when you have to make that decision. 
and you have to deal with the consequences. Ridley becomes another threat lurking in the shadows, another puppet for the ex-parasites to use. And look, it, if you know me, you know that I love Metroid Fusion, so I wish, I really wish that I could tell you that the game sticks to the landing, but there's unfortunately just no way to get around the fact that the payoff is rather clumsy. Fusion's greatest strength is the way that the narrative and the level design work together to contextualise and punctuate its threats, but Ridley is one of the few unfortunate exceptions. He re-emerges during the game's climax, which isn't optimal because it forces the level design to frame him as an interruption. The player is tasked with guiding Samus out of the station as quickly as possible, but to accomplish this they need to stop what they are doing and head off to an unrelated dead end in order to defeat Ridley and recover the screw attack. Afterwards, you just carry on with what you were doing as if nothing happened. The narrative and level design are working against one another. Clumsy execution aside, you can still see how Ridley enhances the core ideas of the game. Demonstrating the powerlessness of an older villain is a simple technique when establishing a new threat, but that's not to say that it isn't effective when executed properly. The danger presented by the ex-parasites is absolute. Just as Samus is disempowered by them, so too is Ridley. Metroid Prime also endeavoured to do something new with the character, albeit more subtly than Fusion. The outline is the same as it was in Super Metroid. Samus encounters Ridley aboard a space station before chasing him down to the space pirate's hideout on a nearby planet. What Prime brings to the character is an interesting thematic texture. The space pirates are portrayed throughout the game as destructive in their pursuit of progress. They spend their time on Talon 4 exploiting the mutagenic Phazon, mutilating themselves and cursing themselves to half-lives, all to increase their military strength. Ridley is the embodiment of this philosophy, having undergone a painful metamorphosis to be reborn as the cybernetic Meta Ridley. Samus stumbles into him escaping the collapsing frigate Orpheon, and her mission at the beginning of the game is to hunt him down. She's soon waylaid by the mystery of the poisoned Talon IV and the artifact temple that seals the source of the Phazon away. The space pirates are trying to solve this mystery as well, but Samus succeeds where they fail because she doesn't erase the past as she goes. Fascist imagery is often applied to the space pirates in Prime, but it is in their erasure of the Chozo civilization that we find the game's most salient critique of that xenophobic philosophy, because it is so self-defeating. Progress cannot be made through destruction. It is impossible to learn more by simply demolishing the answers that one doesn't like. The space pirates can never tap into the motherload of Phazon precisely because they are so intolerant of the Chozo civilization. Between disrupting the pirates' plans and uncovering the mystery of the artifact chamber, the player is given plenty of time to forget about Ridley's presence. And his reintroduction as the manifestation of the space pirates' self-defeating philosophy could not be more perfectly timed than when he swoops in and destroys the artifact temple that the pirates have spent the whole game trying to unlock just as it's unlocking. The first 3D battle against Ridley is everything that you would hope it would be. The distance created when he swoops away to dive bomb Samus gives a great impression of his massive size. Once he lands, he takes up most of the platform that you're fighting on. One of his moves here is to simply turn around, his sheer size making that a dangerous manoeuvre. His animation while he is grounded is fantastic. He's vicious and aggressive, but he's also clearly intelligent hunching over in an effort to defend the weak spot on his chest. Uh, now, I'd, I'd love to keep waxing lyrical about how much I love this character, but we're getting a wee bit pressed by YouTube's non-existent time limits, and besides, I'm sure you get the point. But while Super, Fusion and Prime are my favourites, that's not to say that his other appearances are subpar. Metroid Prime 3 has perhaps the most bombastic opening of any Metroid game, and while I'm not going to do what I've done so far and pretend that he has a deep meaning, I cannot imagine this opening set piece without Ridley. Seeing him spearhead an invasion really justifies his position as the mainstay of their army. 
The requisite battle takes place as Ridley and Samus plummet down a vertical shaft, the time component adding an extra layer of tension to an exciting fight. His later rebirth as Omega Ridley hybridises his appearances in Fusion and Prime, as he demonstrates both how powerful Dark Samus' influence is and how far the space pirates are willing to go to achieve their goals. I mean, hell, even Other M had a crack at establishing a new dynamic between Ridley and Samus. This time, he is the underdog, forced to resort to subterfuge and guerrilla tactics until he can mature. I don't really want to go too far into it, but suffice it to say that the execution leaves a lot to be desired. The scene where he reveals himself is perhaps the most infamous in the entire series. But even so, there are a lot of the same principles at work that define his most successful appearances. He is established before his battle in order to enhance the atmosphere as you're exploring. Insofar as other M can be said to have atmosphere and exploration. In almost every game that he appears in, Ridley transcends his crude appearance and manages to carry a lot of thematic weight. While he was codified in Super Metroid, he's never been stagnant. His changes complement each game and its themes. It's obvious how Ridley became such an incredible villain, an antagonist that enhances the themes and principles of his series so well was always destined to become its nemesis. But say you are a casual fan or that you've only read about the series online, there's a damn good chance that that wasn't what you expected me to say. You may have been waiting for me to say something different. You may have been waiting for me to say something like... If you knew anything at all about Ridley going into this video, it was probably that. Become curious about Ridley and his role in the series and one of the first things you'll hear is that he killed Samus's parents. It is the second sentence on his Wikipedia page, it's the focus of most synopsis videos, and it's the second most popular Ridley topic on Twitter after how much people want to fuck him. The topic seems to be fuelled, at least in part, by incredulity that something so grim would be made by such a child-friendly company. That doesn't happen in a Nintendo game. And I, you're right, anonymous straw man, that doesn't happen in a Nintendo game. No, I mean it, that literally does not happen in a Nintendo game. If you're anything like me, you'd be forgiven for wondering when the hell this was supposed to have happened. Play through every single game in the series from beginning to end and the closest hint you'll find is this an unnamed childhood trauma involving Ridley in Other M. It would be an act of pure imagination, or at the very least confirmation bias, to infer any specifics from this scene. You need to know Samus's backstory in the first place to make sense of it. So the question remains. It's not in any of the cutscenes or logbooks, and it's not in any of the instruction manuals, where and when did Ridley kill Samus's parents? To answer that, we need to go in the most circuitous route possible in order to justify all the time I spent researching this shit. Look, I spent like weeks on this great big comparative analysis and I was going to bring in Batman and the Daleks into it and everything, and then I cut the damn segment because it was getting too complicated. You're going to have to let me have this. From February to June 1994, a Super Metroid tie-in comic was published within the pages of Nintendo Power, the official Nintendo magazine in the US and Canada. Written and illustrated by Benimaru Ito, the series ran for five consecutive issues, loosely adapting the events of the game. Emphasis, of course, on loosely. Metroid seems like it resists adaptation to a linear, non-interactive medium, and so the comic creates a few original characters to fill in some blanks. These include Police Chief Hardy, Armstrong Houston, Keaton, the chairman of the Galactic Federation, and Old Bird. And this is where it gets interesting. Just kidding, this is where it gets really boring unless you're me. The Nintendo Power comic is actually the original text for a lot of Samus's backstory. Her surviving the space pirate raid on Earth Colony K2L, 
her chosen blood, her upbringing on Zebes. The details change slightly over time, but the broad strokes of Samus' backstory remain the same to this very day. The way that this backstory has been preserved is honestly a little bit astonishing. A lot of contemporaneous adaptations of Japanese video games have been dismissed by the parent company going forward, but Nintendo have been fairly steady with this one. K2L is mentioned in the instruction manual of Metroid Prime in 2002, and Old Bird would go on to make an appearance in the story of Zero Mission in 2004. But there's one detail missing, one omission that, when added, would finalise this backstory. And if you've been paying the slightest bit of attention, you know exactly what it is. That brings us neatly to January 2003 and the serialisation of the Metroid manga. Written by Koji Tazawa and illustrated by Kenji Ishikawa, the comic was printed in Kodansha's young adult publication, Monthly Magazine Z. And it's there, in the pages of that manga, that, say it with me now, Ridley kills Samus's mother. Ah, that's right! You see, Ridley doesn't actually kill Samus's dad, he sacrifices himself in order to stop the space pirates. Pedantry aside, the manga follows the backstory established by the Nintendo Power comic, even going so far as to reintroduce Old Bird, Chief Hardy, and Chairman Keaton. It also elaborates on that story in a number of ways, most notably by expanding Ridley's role and establishing that he was responsible for the deaths of Samus's parents. But the interesting thing to me, and the reason that I've spent all this energy establishing a timeline, is cause I'm not entirely convinced that this idea originated in the manga. Because while some may be dubious about the canonicity of the manga, it's corroborated by the Japanese release of Metroid Fusion in February 2003, three months after its North American release, and one month after the manga began publication. Metroid Fusion is infamously text-heavy, and so it was released in Japan with an optional child mode. Child mode made the dialogue easier for children to read, by displaying it in the phonetic hiragana alphabet rather than displaying it in kanji. Aimed at younger children as it is, child mode also removes the ending screens that typically depict Samus in a state of undress. They are instead replaced with images from her past, and included in these images is another dramatisation of the same story, Ridley bearing down on Samus and her parents, Old Bird finding her amongst the ruins, and Old Bird and Grey Voice watching her grow up. Despite their differences, both the magazine Z manga and Metroid Fusion present a unified, singular vision of Samus' backstory, adapted from the 1994 Nintendo Power comic. Ridley led the raid on K2L, Samus's mother and father were evidently killed, and Samus was adopted by the Chozo. By this point, Ridley's popularity had been firmly established due to his presence in Super Metroid, and so it was easy to predict that they would give him a more prominent role in Samus's backstory. The K2L raid even provided a convenient setup. Now, I don't know how these plot points made their way to Japan in the first place. It's possible that they had this story in mind all the way back in 1994, but Benimaru Ito is a prominent figure in the Pokemon and Kirby franchises, so it's also possible that they made their way across the Pacific with him. But regardless of how the outline got there, the additions made in Japan stayed in Japan for the most part. The Metroid manga has never been released worldwide, and there was no need for the international versions of Fusion to include a child mode. If, like me, you live in the West and you grew up with the series, then the assertion that Ridley killed Samus's parents would be, and was, a bit bewildering. All of that having been said, there is actually a way to access the child mode endings if you live in the West. But if you never knew that, then I wouldn't blame you. I only found out about it at the last minute while doing the research for this video. To do so, you will need the following. One copy of Metroid Fusion. One copy of Metroid Zero Mission. One Game Boy Advance link cable. And you see where this is going, two Game Boy Advance consoles. Connect the two games and you can view the complete gallery from Metroid Fusion in Metroid Zero Mission, including the child mode endings. 
and as far as I know, this is the only time that Ridley's presence on K2L has ever been referenced in Western media. This one picture hidden behind two games, two Game Boy Advances, and a link cable. You'll forgive me if this seems like I'm jumping to conclusions, but I'm going to go ahead and say that this picture is not the reason that Ridley became so popular. This picture is not the reason that Ridley killed Samus's parents is parroted whenever the character is brought up. So how did this become the case? How did this one incident, as well hidden as it is, become the incident that Ridley is known for? Well, it might have something to do with the fact that, going by the sales figures, if you're aware of Ridley at all, it's because of his appearances in another series. Ridley has been a mainstay of Super Smash Bros, appearing in almost every game in the series. And for what seems like most of that time, fans have been clamouring for him to be added as a playable character. It got to the point that Ridley is too big for Smash became something of a meme within the community, after director Masahiro Sakurai insisted that the character was simply too large to be playable. His argument was that shrinking him down would fail to do the character justice, not that that's ever stopped them before, but the community made themselves clear. They wanted Ridley. So when the trailer for Super Smash Bros Ultimate dropped, I remember my friend asking me why I wasn't all that excited that Ridley was finally in Smash Bros. After all, I am a huge Metroid fan. But that's exactly it, I am a huge Metroid fan. I'm not a huge Smash Brothers fan. Look, I like Smash Brothers, but I don't love it. And honestly, while I would never be seriously upset by people being excited for something they love, I am a bit exhausted by all the hype. The entirety of pop culture for the last decade has been predicated on crossover appeal. The biggest franchise in the world right now is a crossover franchise. And don't get me wrong, the first time that I saw Samus fighting Sonic, it was exciting. But that was all the way back in 2008, and at some point, for me at least, that magic wore off. Judging by the sales figures, I'm in the minority. 13.81 million units of Super Smash Bros Ultimate shipped in just 6 months. To put that in perspective, the Metroid series has sold somewhere around 18 million units across almost 33 years. If you're wondering why Nintendo stopped making Metroid games, there's your answer. Going by those numbers, and taking into account that Metroid fans are likely to buy more than one game in the series, I don't think it's too much of a stretch to guess that a large portion of Smash Bros audience haven't played many Metroid games, if any at all. So Smash Bros exposed Ridley to a whole new audience, an audience that is much larger than Metroid's, an audience wherein the majority probably haven't played many Metroid games, and an audience who are given something of a skewed perspective of Metroid as a result. The fact is, Super Smash Bros has never really represented Metroid all that accurately. From Zero Suit Samus's high heels, to Dark Samus and her Jojo poses, to... Samus is under fire! Right, that, that's plenty. I find that Smash Bros has never been quite as faithful to Metroid as it has been to other series. And I don't really blame them. It's a tall order to transplant this... into a series known for this. But nevertheless, it has to be acknowledged that playing Super Smash Bros doesn't really give you a strong idea of what Metroid is all about. But that having been said, the Metroid character that Smash has done the most justice, I would argue, is Ridley. And that makes sense, his savagery and his monstrous appearance are a good fit for both series. From his cameo in Melee's intro, to his boss battles in Brawl's Subspace Emissary, 
to the stage hazard in the Wii U version, to his playable appearance in Ultimate. Every time, Smash Brothers gets Ridley right. It's no wonder he became such a popular character, it's actually kind of vindicating. The character that the Smash community seem to have latched onto is the one that is the most accurate reflection of the Metroid series. Ah, it's alright, we can share custody. I mean, we're only going to need him like once every eight years or so. But therein lies the problem. While I am pleased that Ridley became so popular, his appearances in Smash also exposed the character to a large new audience that are unaware of his original context. And divorced from his original context as he is, Ridley needs a quick and easy way to establish himself as the Metroid series main villain. You cannot impart all of the qualities that I described in part 1 in an easy to digest trophy description. So Ridley, to most of the people that know him, is instead reduced to a single sentence. Alright, so cards on the table. I'm not a fan of the Ridley killed Samus's parents plot point. I think it is a misrepresentation of why that character is so brilliant, and I think it's a shame that that misrepresentation has become the most popular version of the character. Ridley became the main villain of Metroid despite never actually being the main antagonist of any of the games because he complements its design, its themes, its philosophy so perfectly. But the manga, on the other hand, doesn't. It fails to accurately reflect the series that it's adapting. The theatrical incredulity at the violence on display in the pages of this manga misses a very important fact. Magazine Z was a seinen publication, meaning that it was aimed at young adults. I stress this because I want to make it clear that this magazine was not for children. While they commissioned Kodansha to produce the manga, this was not Nintendo's sterilised stable. Magazine Z also published adaptations of Devilman, Fully Cooley, and, appropriately enough, Batman. But the Metroid manga doesn't adjust to the demographic change elegantly. It instead makes a seemingly self-conscious effort to be mature by being grim and edgy. And so Ridley goes beyond villainous and becomes ridiculous. Later in the manga, he boasts to Samus about how he consumed her mother's corpse to replenish his strength. And it's never a good sign when you're courting comparisons with the absorbal off out of Doctor Who. Ridley is presented in the games as a predatory intelligence. He's evidently clever, and yet his intelligence is not in manipulation or psychological warfare or military strategy. There's a good reason that he has never been the main antagonist. There's a good reason that he answers to a higher power, because that's when the character works best. He is a simple character. He is a giant, fire-breathing pterodactyl from outer space. If you wanted to design that kind of ingenious strategist, that military leader, you would make them, I don't know, how about a giant brain in a jar? But the way I feel it's often presented is, in order to understand the Metroid series, you need to read this decade-old manga that has never been officially released in English. But you didn't, because Ridley killing Samus' parents has nothing to do with the story or the themes or the atmosphere of Metroid. It's not a revenge story, and neither is it the story of how Ridley self-defeatingly created the Space Pirate's greatest enemy. This is an interpretation that the series is not interested in following up. Despite ample opportunity, Nintendo have made absolutely no effort to even acknowledge this backstory in the series itself. The only reference that has ever been made is tucked away in an extremely obscure easter egg. But the fact is, saying the sentence Ridley killed Samus's parents is the easiest way to cement his status as the main villain. Let me tell you, if somebody killed Mamo, I would be raging, and that's why it's such an easy way to create conflict. I just think it's a shame that in order to create that conflict, 
The Metroid series needs to discard what makes it special and dive headlong into cliché. So, some people that aren't interested in Metroid have a different perspective of what the main villain is like. So what? But treating Ridley this way, treating him as the main villain, has some negative consequences for the series storytelling. Both remakes had their endings disrupted because Ridley just had to put in an appearance at the end. The series has always been excellent at justifying fan service. Returning characters retain their impact because they make perfect sense within a new context. At first, I thought that Zero Mission's Ridley robot was a perfect example. It's a wee bit out of nowhere, but it establishes Ridley as a more persistent threat than Kraid or Mother Brain, and it foreshadows his resurrection as a cyborg in Metroid Prime. But it turns out I was giving the game too much credit. According to Yoshio Sakamoto, Ridley built this robot duplicate himself to brag about how great he is. It's as though Nintendo confused him with their other fire-breathing reptilian antagonist. Although, to be fair, they seem to be sceptical about how seriously to take that story themselves. Is that canon? More egregious is the ending of Metroid Samus Returns, the 2017 remake of 1991's Metroid 2. The ending of the original game sees Samus climb back to the surface alongside the infant Metroid. The tense descent into the depths of SR388 is contrasted by the serene ascent. A game's worth of killing is contrasted by an act of mercy. It isn't overstated, the player is simply given a quiet moment to ruminate on their journey before the game closes out. It may seem to some like a pointless interruption, but I think it's a wonderful bit of pacing that adds a sort of melancholy tinge to the final moments. It would have been so easy for a cutscene to play and the credits to roll after defeating the Metroid Queen, but the developers must have decided that it was important for the player to return to the starship and bring this story full circle by themselves. It may not resonate with every player in the same way that being told how to feel by a cutscene might, but the possibility that it may resonate more strongly with some players makes it worth including. The ending of the remake throws Ridley in, and it's incredible how disruptive he is. He makes a surprise appearance after the player has already collected all the power-ups and defeated the final boss. He doesn't create atmosphere or enhance exploration, he doesn't change to complement the theme. Instead, he distracts from it. By the time the credits roll, I'm not even thinking about the Metroids. According to an interview with Hobby Consolas, the motivation for Ridley's return was simply fan service. He's the main villain. What better final boss for the series' triumphant return after a long absence? But speaking as a fan, that kind of fan service is exactly what I don't want out of this series. I'm a fan in the first place because the series has always had more restraint than to just resort to cheap thrills. But this scene is uncharacteristically superficial for the series. It is predicated entirely on the shallow, transient excitement of recognising a returning character. I dread the day that Mother Brain is resurrected for a third time, or when Silox interrupts the final boss out of nowhere to claim Samus's life for himself. I don't want Ridley to become routine. There is a damn good reason that the character became as popular as he did, but if his future appearances are just going to coast by on his status as the series' arch nemesis, then he runs the risk of being a disruption rather than the augmentation that he's been until now. The fact is, experiencing a story is a very different thing to reading the plot of that story. Read the plot synopsis for Super Metroid and Ridley is barely mentioned, but play Super Metroid and you might be surprised by how big a part of the game he is. Ridley is a great villain because he is attuned to the series' themes. Exploration and discovery, growth, the destructive pursuit of progress, and the tension between the fear of the unknown and the satisfaction of discovery. 
and you cannot create an accurate impression of this character just by reading a plot synopsis, or even by watching this video. I said earlier that you can't capture part one in a sentence, and while that's a pithy line, the reality is that you cannot know what it is like to play these games by having me explain them to you. To really get an authentic impression of what Ridley is like, you have to go and play the games. Ridley, in his original incarnation, is a very different character to his most popular interpretation as a sadistic, cannibalistic schemer. This popular interpretation is one that basically doesn't exist in the Metroid series. This popular interpretation, truncated through summary as it is, fails to capture the appeal that made Ridley so popular in the first place. Instead, a minor part, a tiny, tiny part of this series, has become what most people know this character for. And that's not the Metroid that I want to champion. That's not the Metroid that I am really enthusiastic about. That interpretation spells doom for Ridley as an impactful, memorable presence. Instead, he can just show up whenever. You only need to know one thing about him. He killed Samus's parents. Thank you very much for watching. I would also like to give a huge thank you to all of the names that are scrolling past the screen just now, as well as all of my other patrons for all their patience and generosity. If you too would like to help support the show, then you can do so at the Patreon link, which should be somewhere on screen just now. Cheers!